Uh, hi everyone, so my name is Neil Saunders and I head up the uh, platform team at Beamly. Uh, my responsibilities include everything from environment management, uh, deployment strategy and continuous delivery platform, architecture and resilience, uh, and also ensuring a startup at the office printer works. Um, in addition, I'm responsible for the security of, of all of the above. Um, and I'm going to talk today around some of the challenges we found in forcing security um, and some of the approaches we've come up, uh, come up with to, to address these. Um, so to kind of set the scene, what, why is this important? Um, so does anyone remember a company called Codespaces? Yeah. So Codespaces were um, a startup set up to provide competition to, to GitHub. There were 23 employees. Um, one day, um, some attacker gained access to their AWS console, sent them an email, um, sending them a ransom. Um, their response to that was to go around trying to patch up any holes they might have considered them getting into. Unfortunately, that attacker had already created an IAM user in the back, saw them doing this, and hit the new button. That's 23 people out of the job overnight. That's why this is important. <coughs> so startups are a great places to work. I mean, we have a huge competitive advantage um, compared to enterprises, and they, you know, RFPs, long-winded procurement processes, um, and there are tools that broadly help us do large swathes of our jobs. You know, we don't build data centers anymore, we generally host it, we go to AWS. You know, there are solutions like DataLoop out there to help us do monitoring, there are alerting, pager duties, email, all of this stuff, all of these are solved problems. Um, it's unlikely that I'll be able to do it better than any of the big players, um, and it detracts, and more importantly, from the biggest contribution I can make, which is automation. Um, unfortunately, that some of these, these uh, third-party services are kind of implemented pretty quickly. They're not always configured as securely as they could be, um, and that leads to some problems. Let's kind of highlight this. Um, this is a kind of small section of some of the services that Beamly use to help us on our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, it's about a third. So I'm just going to run through a few scenarios just to again kind of pound the message home of why this is important for us. So let's play a little game. Um, so we at Beamly, it's not my choice, um, for get heck all, we use Office 365 free map. So on a scale of zero, i.e. there's nothing an attacker could do, to ten, they could wipe your company off the face of the map. How much threat does having an email account give an attacker? An un, you know, unprivileged email account, standard email account. And answer to yourself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty hard. Um, and my mind immediately jumps to social engineering. Of course, there's lots of things you can do there. Um, actually, for us, um, the answer is it depends if you use Slack and how it's configured. Um, so Beamly, Slack found its way into, into our organization the same way I imagine it found its way into a lot of organizations, um, which is we got bored of using Skype. Someone tried a load of solutions, Slack stuck, and everyone started using it. Um, it's very popular, suited our needs, and it, you know, it's crack for communication, basically. Um, but the purse, I didn't, I didn't implement it initially. Someone else took the privilege of kind of setting that up. And unbeknownst to me, there are two options for when you sign up. You can either have someone invite you um, to a Slack community, or you can kind of defer your authentication to your email provider. So if you've got an email address, you can self-serve and create yourself a Slack account. Um, but that's really important because all of a sudden you've just delegated responsibility for you, another communication channel to the person who's responsible for you setting up your emails. Ask yourself, who is responsible for creating emails in your organization? Are they security savvy? Do they use you know, a 32-digit password you know, in LastPass? Or is it the one they use for their you know, Ocado online shopping that's stuck to their monitor? You don't, you don't know. Um, or at least we didn't. <laughs> um, so obviously things like Slack, I mean, once you've got access to it, it's not just, a, it's not just an email push, push uh, communications account. If someone were to breach that, they've got a searchable archive of every conversation all of our engineers have ever had. That's pretty huge. Ask yourself now, what, what's in those communicate? you know, what's, what is it, what's in those chats? Now, you know, Beamly, we're... We're very lucky, we've got a fantastic engineering team, and we all know not to share passwords in public channels, that's great. But that doesn't stop, I mean, what I could do if I were intelligent, if I were on Slack, is set up uh, watchwords, so I could just lurk in a channel, install Slack on my mobile, and have push notifications for any terms that, that, I, that I fancy. Um, 
this stuff's real. So you know, these are the kind of attacks that you can you can start to imagine. Uh, the opacity not working very well, and there's some other surfaces there. Um, but it's not always technical destruction. So we also use Mailchimp um, to send our customers mail shots and the like. Um, gaining access to that service didn't go out and to shut the site down. But I could go onto Google, search, you know, turn off safe search, safe search, search for worst image on the internet, and send it to every one of our clients. Um, bear in mind that our minimum age as an entertainment customer is 13. So, I mean, you can imagine the reputational damage that would cause. It would be massive. Um, again, to get slightly more technical, Fastly, great CDN, we use them. Um, very powerful, very configurable. Um, if I gained access to Fastly, sure, I could delete all our distributions and you know, give our site a 404. But I could be much more creative than that. I could inject some JavaScript. I could silently you know, pass the input fields of our, of our forms and then send them on to a third-party service. All this stuff is silent and not, we wouldn't necessarily know about it. Um, it's quite scary. Broadly, it's, it's security Jenga, and one, a, a small security oversight in one system can be used to compromise another. Um, are you aware when a new email address gets added? You know, if you, if you use AWS and you've got a security group and you've got a list, you're staring at a list of 200 IP address uh, restrictions, what do they mean? You can't add notes to these things. Where do they come from? When were they added? What will break if I delete it? Whose GitHub account is this? What's this hook on my GitHub repository? The list is endless, and my point is it's easily the work of a dedicated team, but in the startup, this team will simply never exist. Um, and like I said in the beginning, my job, the most value I can deliver is, is through automation. The, the less time spent on this, the better. So I'm going to talk about one potential solution and, and, and how we address that. So we do something. Um, so what I'd like is a lightweight process that actively audits security things and alerts your security team when something doesn't smell right. Uh, it needs to be extensible to keep up with all these new cool third-party services being added. Um, and adding services needs to take up as little time as possible. So we need to start with a single secure point of truth. So if you want to audit things, we need something to audit against. Um, this can be as simple as a GitHub, a file on GitHub. So I know the Guardian have done um, some good work with this, um, tracking GitHub users specifically, but this is slightly more extensible. Um, we chose LDAP. Um, it is deserving in its reputation as a pain in the ass to set up. It took us six months to properly secure it, build it, test it, run it. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Um, but on the plus side, it does integrate with everything else and provides a lot of ancillary benefit. Um, we took standard, standard, standard LDAP server, um, used the standard project user stuff, and then extended that, created the schema extension specifically for all Beamly employees, um, with GitHub ID, Facebook user UID, and critically public SSH key as well. Uh, at first, this was internal only, but now it's externally accessible. So once we've done this, we can start writing some unit tests. You've got a, a known version controlled state, and if you can programmatically extract the list of security things from a service that you're using, you can compare against it. Um, so it applies to multiple things. So like I mentioned, they have security groups, users on these services, GitHub books. Um, and critically, if you're using GitHub to track these exceptions, you've got, um, you've got, you've got traceability through where these things are added. So we've impl implemented these as um, a set of security tests <coughs> written in Python um, using the PyUnit framework. Um, the idea being that I'd like them to be short and quick to write, executed every 10 minutes via a continuous delivery pipeline, um, and a failure will trigger, trigger uh, an email alert to the platform team, um, and then in addition to that, you can wire this up to whatever you like, page GT, push notification to your phone. Uh, platform team can then log in and take appropriate action. So let's take a look at an example of one of these things. Right. Um, so this is a script, IP addresses have been changed, but you get the idea, um, for a Python script that tests our Amazon security groups. The idea is we're going to test every single exception in every single security group in every single region. Um, so we define a set of exceptions in the top. I want to be able to allow HTTP to get in, some VPN stuff in there. And then every single IP address or IP address range needs to be commented. You need to have known what it is. That's the top of the script. The bottom of the script is written as a kind of pseudo unit test. 
Um, so we're defining a method to assert that a global exception is valid. We're defining an assertion to that an IP address is known. And then we've got the kind of test method that iterates over all the regions that we're active in, pulls out every security group, and then asserts whether that's known or valid. That's one example. And then in your continuous delivery platform, that might look like something like this. Um, so you can see here we've had uh, a period where we're failing our security security checks, and in my in inbox it looks something like that. So we get a failure um, and a link, and if I click the link, the output looks something like this. Um, so you can see all of the different unit tests that are running. So the security group test was, was just one of those. Um, every dot represents a thing that's being tested, so 1,280 in total. Um, and we've got one failure there, and what we can see is we've asserted that with Slack user that we pulled back from work with the API has two-factor authentication enabled. It doesn't, assertion fails, that triggers a failure. Um, so you kind of see at a glance what's going wrong, and then you can additionally wire that up to other bits and pieces. So we use ThoughtWorks Go for continuous delivery, they've got a little tool called CC Menu. You can have that running in the top, so I've got a continuous red-green light in the top. If anything I care about fails, then including a security audit, then it, it, goes, it goes red and pops me up a message. Again, um, added advantages, so you track your um, security exceptions as well. By GitHub, you can see exactly who added the exception, removed an exception, and when. Um, so we've written scripts for, at the moment, uh, these services. Um, so Office 365, um, I assert that all of our users are known in LDAP. In GitHub, I assert that we know about every single GitHub ID in our organization. They've all got two-factor authentication enabled. Slack, same thing, all users are user known enabled. Every IAM account, um, if they've got a password, has two-factor authentication enabled, Jira and PagerDuty. Um, I was hoping to have all these things open sourced for today. Um, didn't quite manage it. Um, look out for the next two weeks if you're interested. We'd love everyone's contributions. Um, so before I kind of touched on um, LDAP um, as kind of the first thing that we kind of implemented, and a lot of people, I kind of talked to this about, said, well, it kind of fails, you'll get up and running quickly if you're spending six months setting up an LDAP directory. And that, that's entirely fair and it's entirely valid. Um, I have the opinion that there are certain things in DevOps and engineering where you just can't escape a large amount of work up front. Um, and I kind of make the analogy of a flywheel. So the initial energy to get this thing moving is, is fairly hard, um, LDAP, but once it's, once it's spinning, the additional incremental energy that you need to add on to this and build on, on this capability is, is moderately small, i.e. Um, security audit scripts. So other things that we've kind of built on top of LDAP, so uh, our VPN terminators are now hooked in uh, to LDAP. Um, we have all host level access using public SSH keys source, source that for LDAP directory. Um, pseudo access via groups configured in LDAP. We've got NASs in the office that also hook in externally. Um, and any application broadly that supports LDAP, which are, you know, there are a fair few. Um, incrementally, these savings add up, and it's my opinion that over a given period of time, you will more than save the time that you spend in implementing something like something like LDAP. So, previously, for example, <coughs> we'd use Puppet to push out public keys so everyone could log into instances. You know, as your number of instances grows, that becomes less and less scalable. Are you sure it definitely applied everywhere? Are you sure that the revoked worked in the same in the same instance? You know, issuing certificates for everyone for a VPN, all of these things are slow. Um, and we could have done this if we just had one. Uh, so we also have Elasticsearch cluster set up with Kibana, so that was, again, fairly easy to build on top of. Uh, we send all of our authentication logs and VPN terminators into Elasticsearch. We got a pretty little graph, so I can see when people are logged in, <coughs> highlight things in red, set up alerts off that. Um, so that's kind of the uh, the kind of authentication and, and audit side of it. <clears throat> we also use a tool called OneLogin, um, which essentially allows you to herd all these third-party applications that you're using into one place. Um, it's essentially a password manager on steroids. Um, you centrally manage it. <clears throat> We've added every application that we use. 
Um, we've hooked that into um, our LDAP directory and then also mandated that two-factor authentication be used. Um, so what you're getting is essentially single sign-on services out of the box and then you control access via LDAP groups. Um, users never need to know the password for shared systems um, and allows you as a platform team to bulk rotate uh, passwords for shared systems. Um, it looks like this, this is one view. Um, so you log in, got pretty buttons that you can mash. Um, and the idea is on the right hand side you can see all of the activity that users, um, all, the, all the activity that users are doing, which applications they're logging into and out in when. It provides you a good audit trail. And it's really easy to manage, so you're not logging into multiple systems anymore. When you add a new system, you, you set it up and you have to define and hack it in the HTML form. Um, but then once that's done, um, it gives you quite a nice interface to allow you to assign permissions to which users or groups of users can allow, uh, have permissions on certain applications. Okay, so now what? So now we've got a framework that kind of alerts us to anything suspicious um, that we can build on. We're able to instantly provision and revoke users. And by going through this process, and it is quite an arduous process, um, I've got a fair level of confidence that we've kind of checked all the right boxes and set, set the right settings. Um, we pick all the low-hanging fruit and, and then some. Um, does anyone know uh, the term preppers? Yeah? I, didn't, I wasn't aware there's a TV show uh, that came out about this before I put the slide on. Um, for anyone who's not aware, preppers are a kind of subset of the American population that genuinely believe the world is going to suffer Armageddon in their lifetime. <laughs> exactly what type of Armageddon, they don't know. It could be financial collapse, civil unrest, World War III. But they all handle it in roughly the same way. What are these things? Well, broadly, they line their basements with concrete and fill them with non-perishable goods. Stage one to be a good prepper. Got to have food. Number two, they arm themselves to the team with a lot of automatic weapons. And number three, if they've got children, they teach those kids how to defend the beans from the hungry post apocalyptic unprepared types. So at this point, you're, you're wondering, OK, this is either amusing and or terrifying, but what, what's the point? Is it, you know, what's, the, what's the relation to security? Um, my argument is be a prepper, think like a prepper. Preparation will only get you so far, but unfortunately your organisation is full of humans and it's that element that will let you down, expect it, plan for it. <coughs> um, you know, you only have to look around for exploits like Hartley's to demonstrate that you know, no system is 100% secure. Plan for Armageddon unless you plan to eliminate all the humans from the organisation. <coughs> um, so apologies to anyone who hasn't seen Red Dwarf before, I think it probably covers most of it. If you haven't, do yourself a favour, the number one thing you can do from this talk is go and watch it. Um, for anyone that has, um, you'll remember the scene that kind of day you find up stasis and there's little, little pattern, piles of white powder everywhere where his friends used to be. Um, my, my message is imagine yourself in your company coming on a Monday and, and instead of, you know, RDS instances and EC2 instances and code and backups, you've got little bits of white powder. What do you do, seriously? Close your eyes and imagine it. Part one, stock your stores, backups. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be patronising here, we're all professionals, we all know the value of backups. Um, but we should remind ourselves that code spaces also have backups as well, um, and look where they are. Um, and, and hands up, like, beam Leal, far from perfect in this, in this, in this area. Um, taking backups as code spaces have demonstrated isn't good enough. Um, so there's a concept called a 3 to 1 backup plan, which involves taking three copies of your data, two of them in different formats, and storing one of them off-site. Critically, S3 multi-region is not off-site. <laughs> this is to protect an Amazon outage, not to protect you from an attack. Um, if I can delete the same thing with the same API key, it's not multi, no, it's not off-site. Um, use another cloud provider um, or do it on site, NAS, however you want to do it. Um, lots of options, you know about them all. Um, I wasn't aware. Uh, March 31st is apparently World Backup Day. Um, so everyone take note of that very important day. Uh, part two run through restoring from nothing. In the event of Armageddon, you need to get back up and running as quickly as humanly possible. You know, Seriously take to consider for a second, if you are a startup and you are using a cloud provider like Amazon, how much configuration is potentially unmanaged, so you know, 
It'd be PC configuration, security groups, routing tables, your DNA, you know, Fuse Route 53 of DNS, subnet configurations. There's so much stuff here which isn't code, um, which could potentially be lost. Um, and yes, ideally you just have all of this in CloudFormation, but being we set all this stuff up before CloudFormation is available. Um, there is a tool, if you're using AWS, called CloudFormer, um, which just attempts to take uh, running things and turn them into a CloudFormation template. Um, honestly, we've had somewhat mixed results of that with exporting thousands of things. Um, your mileage may vary, we're, we're still working with it. Uh, to sum up our approach, if a service supports two-factor authentication, it's mandatory. No ifs, no buts, no we're aiming for 70%, 80%, it's on. Uh, for us, that currently means Slack, MailChimp, GitHub, AWS, and OneLogin. If a service has an API for exporting a security config, users, things, um, try and knock up a quick script for it. Um, all of our third-party services are in one login. We both rotate our shared passwords regularly using this tool and prepare for Armageddon. Back up, you know, think of your continuous delivery configuration as well. Uh, AWS setup and all your data tiers backed up using 3 2 one Again, I'm not saying you this. Um, in Beamly, we have a concept of Kaizen days um, every sprint. So that's a day dedicated to just improving things, um, nothing that's in a sprint plan. Um, I spend most of my usually writing scripts for this kind of stuff. Um, so lessons learned. Uh, retrofitting security is really hard. Be prepared to break lots of things, albeit temporarily. So when I was putting the script together for AWS security groups, for example, I have absolutely no idea what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm literally going through emails, searching for this IP address in Jira, in Slack. If I can't find anything, then it's going on the list for deletion. I have to batch them up, you know, I'll do 20 a day, delete them all, wait for the, red, wait for the alarm to go off. If it doesn't, great, move on. <laughs> it's hard retrofitting this stuff. Um, explain why it's important to everyone else in your organization and bring them along for the ride. Um, so I've given talks like this internally just to explain that I'm not trying to be a pain in the ass for the sake of being a pain in the ass. Um, I'm genuinely trying to implement some kind of security to, you know, to prevent against an Armageddon-like situation. Um, we try and build a community around this. So in Slack, we've got a public, chat ch a public <coughs> Slack channel for security, where we can talk about exploits and everything that's happened in the industry, discuss whether we're vulnerable or not, um, planned offenses, that kind of thing. Also, random thing for at the end, um, AWS crowd, Cloud Trail and Config, turn them on, they're basically free um, if someone was in EQS free storage. Um, you mentioned you're using LDAP. Could you explain a little bit your, about your experiences and which LDAP server you use? Is there any? Yep, sure. Um, so we use OpenLDAP. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, the question was which LDAP server do we use um, and my experiences in deploying it. Um, so yeah, we use OpenLDAP. Um, I've never used LDAP before, so the kind of learning curve was, was reasonably, reasonably steep. Um, there are good, really good books on the, on the subject, happily post those now. Um, but like I say, it probably took six months to go from zero to <clears throat> having a populated directory with administration scripts, tested backups, um, and a subset of things integrated. But yeah, happy to talk to you. Uh, regarding your 321 or backup thing, you said about having something offside and Amazon doesn't count. Say, for example, if you were to use a, a separate Amazon account in a different region, how would you classify that? Or what would the difference be? Again, I think, I think, I think it's, 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 it's kind of around putting up a firewall in between those things. I'd say, that, like I said, I do caveat this with we're not doing this in all places. Um, I would probably <coughs> view a separate cloud provider as better than using an, a, another account in Amazon. Um, I can't justify that, I don't know why. It just feels better. Um, <laughs> equally, equally, I would say that depending on the, the volumes of data that we're talking, um, trying to sync that and do a reverse sync from the cloud to somewhere actually physically on site would be really useful. Thank you. Um, so, question. Uh, 
Do you do any um, access monitoring on the database access and SSH access, and how do you identify the breaches of security? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, do we do any active monitoring of um, database access or host level access? Uh, the answer is so, some, yes. Uh, so all of our auth logs um, across all of our instances, we bake in um, essentially a streamer to an elastic search cluster. So every instance that comes up sends its auth logs, failures, successes to a centralized uh, location. We've got dashboards and monitoring over that looking for, looking for failures. RDS and database access, uh, no. Um, only because it's, it's probably harder to audit if you're not running it yourself uh, in terms of RDS. And a lot of these, a lot, a lot of the NoSQL databases um, tend not to have great authentication. So they've got like data stacks and things Cassandra, but otherwise it's kind of hit and miss. Security, some of these things you can tell is kind of a not, not an afterthought, but it's secondary to the to the function of the right. But uh, I mean, like, suppose you're to factor up the compromise, would you be able to identify that someone is using a, uh, someone's account maliciously? Uh, again, it, it, it didn't, sorry, the question was, if we got compromised, would we be able to determine if an account was being used maliciously? Um, there are so, I mean, there are so many permutations of how an attack might take place. Um, the answer is, it, it, it depends. I'm not trying to tap on shoulder, it depends on the nature of the attack. So we do have you know, CloudTrail turned on, we can see which access keys are used. If we know a resource has been destroyed, we can start, we can, we, we've got a lot of information on this stuff, whether it's all of the information and enough to, you know, to put it all together for a specific attack, I couldn't honestly say. We collect as much as we can um, and send it all broadly to the same place. So I'd like to think so, but I can guarantee it. How often do you simulate Armageddon? <laughs> uh, so the question was, how often do we simulate Armageddon? Um, not often enough. Um, so we've done, you know, we take certain components and we do the kind of um, chaos monkey thing, where we'll shut instances down um, to ensure they come back up and stream and replicate and all the rest of it. In terms of, you know, simulating a region outage, We've not done that. Um, to be perfectly honest, perfectly honest, we're probably not quite there with everything we need to be to be able to do that. Um, but that's where we're looking to get to, hopefully, in the you know very near future. Can you share how big was your team when you started all these policies, and how much time weekly do you dedicate to improve? <coughs> Just to give an idea. To uh, so, the, startup. so yeah, yeah. So the, so the question was how big. Uh, is the team that, that writes this stuff, and how much time do you spend dedicating to, to developing it? Um, so the answer is it's changed. At its peak, the platform team was eight. The current platform team is now two. Uh, <laughs> uh, so at its peak, when it was eight, this was when this was this we started implementing LDAP and, and kind of centralised authentication. Um, that took around six months for one person. Um, and like I say, the scripts, the initial kind of tranche of scripts were written in maybe two weeks. Some, some are harder than others, so you know, auditing email requires you to learn PowerShell, for example, which is just hellish. Um, so some take longer than others, but like I say, I try now, every Kaizen day, which is you know, one, one day every two weeks, I'll try and not to get another script. Right. Okay. Um, you, you talked about one aspect of security. Intrusion detection set up as well, because you said about the little bit of light on the Yeah, we have. It's a brilliant thing to have. Yeah. Plug IDS alerts into that as well? Uh, we don't at the moment. Um, that's something certainly we can look at. But again, it's the kind of the kind of tone of the talk is trying to strike the right balance. Um, you know, whether we need to invest more, well, we can always invest more. And like I say, it's, it's you know, easily the remit of dedicated team. Um, this is what we've managed to achieve with the resources that we've had. Um, I would certainly love to look at IDS. We don't, we don't have anything like that. Over and above monitoring of Elasticsearch all the yeah. um, Just uh, sort of wondering about um, your approach to backups and things. Um, you're saying you need to do three copies, you know, one on Amazon, one on site, one on site. 
I'm saying best practice, so she should do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of volume of data uh, are you guys talking about? Yep. Are there any external uh, services you could provide for uh, scanning security? Uh, so the question were any, uh, any services I could recommend for scanning uh, security vulnerabilities? Um, not honestly, no, I've not done a lot of research into this. It's mainly been um, battening down hatches. Um, I know there are tools out there. I think there was one I'd seen that Google had launched. I forget. It's an entire framework. It looks like a clip someone might have. Um, that allows you to essentially throw everything at a specific IP address or set. Um, and also helps you kind of sculpt attacks. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, if you grab me afterwards, then I'll, I'll find it. Um, but that looks pretty cool. Um, Is there anything that um, kind of makes uh, your infrastructure kind of different? Like, I know a lot of people uh, are changing their way that if they think about security with the kind of the mutual infrastructure type thing where most instances are kind of short lived and just disappear most of the time. Like, how, what's your approach to that? Uh, so the question was, uh, what's our design on infrastructure in terms of mutual infrastructure and how does that improve things? <coughs> um, so we use um, essentially the model of we have a base image that we maintain and then we bake um, application code and configuration on top of that. Um, so that's been useful um, in, uh, by, it's, it's useful about allowing us to roll things like this out so I can roll out an LDAP client um, with pre-configured certificates etc. Um, so new services as they're deployed um, automatically have that configuration. We still suffer the problem that existing instances um, won't have an up-to-date configuration. Um, so there are still some instances out there, quite honestly, that don't have LDAP integration. And we still use um, SSH keys to <coughs> those things. Um, the idea is, though, of moving, again, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more automated they are, the more velocity you have, the quicker they <coughs> cycle themselves out. So what I'd like to get to is, you know, is a, is a, is a state where we're cycling things out so quickly that by the time you've rolled something out, within a week, you've got 90% coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I've got a question. Uh, 